right, everybody, welcome to UCR Late Night. <laughs> My name is Brian Glover, in case you didn't know right off of that logo over there. But I am the host of UCR Late Night. Welcome, everyone. All right, so it's week eight. Usually heat is around this time, right? Week eight of winter quarter. Now, a lot of people have been really upset, you know, he got canceled and all this stuff, but rightfully so, the Heat lineup was pretty dope. Like, honestly. No, no, no seriously, the Heat lineup is Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade, <laughs> Hassan White. Do I need to list the whole lineup? It's like 16, 16 different people coming. <laughs> um, all right, so recently love has been in the air. You know, Valentine's Day was last week. It's been really, it's been, people have been in really good moods. Um, so love has been in the air, but we can't tell if it's coming from the students or the trees. Because <laughs> it smells like there's a lot of loving going on. <laughs> Alright, so like I said, the weather's been changing a lot, y'all, and I had this really cool joke about the weather, but I've been so indecisive that, just like the weather. <laughs> now, the weather's been so unpredictable that our very own mascot, Scotty the Bear, decided to relocate, get out of here, and actually what? go to Mars. So let's see how Scotty's doing right now. <laughs> right on tip of curiosity, having a good time. It's a Highlander pride. All right, everyone, we have a great show tonight. We have Tamka Smith-Jones, the athletics director, our professor, Wallace Cleves, and a student here by the name of Daniel Lopez. So tune in next time. Oh, we just, you know, fast forward real quick. <laughs> Please welcome our very first guest on the show, Athletics Director Tamika Smith-Jones. Woo! <laughs> Go ahead and strut that long walk down here. All right. Yeah. That's That's it? All right, all right, so tell us some of your background. Well, I was just like most of you all in the audience. I was a um, scholar and had a, a talent, which was basketball, and I equate that to the arts in, in most cases on higher eds. Um, and I had a dream, and that was to um, get educated and go to college and, and become a, a great citizen and professional, and I got a chance to do that. Um, as a full scholarship athlete at Troy University, I started okay. there. Division one program, I transferred um, in my sophomore year to Alabama a and where I finished my career and was able to do some of the things that I wanted to do socially and not just be a uh, Jersey number. What were some of those social things? <laughs> I pledged Delta Sigma Theta hey. Sigma Theta Incorporated. Okay. That was okay. one of them. Shout out. Shout um, out. But then I was able to um, go to Savannah State as a graduate assistant. So I, I was a graduate assistant for basketball, women's basketball. Learned a lot about the business. Um, became an assistant coach full time and got into administration. And from there it was a, a great journey. I mean, I. I but prior to coming to UCR, I was at the University of Texas at San Antonio, mm -hmm. um, which was a football institution. <laughs> football? Is that right? Uh, that's right. And we don't know anything about that here. You don't know anything about that here. <laughs> um, I've met some of the football greats here, but I, I started out as an athletic director at the Division II level at mm -hmm. Clark Atlanta University, which is a historically black college and university. Uh, it was a lot of training ground for me. I got a chance to get my hands in a lot of, of, of things in the athletic world and also in higher ed. It's a high research institution. So I think that prepared me more so for where I am today at, at UCR. Awesome. Awesome. Now, if it serves my recollection right, you are actually one of 20 female athletic directors out of 300 in all of the Division I athletics. Is Can that correct? Can you believe that? Yes. Yeah. 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 Athletic director. Yes. Yeah. We've got one of the 20 out of 300. Now, we already talked about it, or at least kind of alluded to it, but. C congratulations, by the way. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> Let's go ahead and just get straight to it. What is the possibility of bringing a football team to UC Riverside? <laughs> football at UCR. Um, well, you know what? Um, I would love to see football back at UCR, um, but the first thing we have to take care of what we have now. And we have 17 sports, men's and women's basketball, soccer, um, doing very well. We are in spring sports now uh, with baseball and um, softball, tracks, uh, volleyball. So I need butts in the seats mm. now. Mm -hmm. um, but, but because our, our student athletes, first of all, they're students just like you know everyone else on this campus. And they try to balance a lot. 
and for them not to see the support of their peers and, and um, friends out on the campus, um, it's tough. I've been in that seat before. I've been a player. Um, I've coached them. So um, to get that energy in the building, to really have an exciting environment, a college experience for all of our students, not just for the athletes sake, I think that brings a lot of attention to our campus. Um, media, you wouldn't know this, but I'll tell you this. Um, we hadn't had more than about five um, ESPN or Fox Sports games before mm -hmm. my arrival. Um, I asked for more, and they gave us about 15 this year. So now when you come into the arena, you see a lot of media because they're having us. And that's the Big West Conference, they, and just because I asked for it. So I think with, with I mean, you don't have to be that smart, okay? <laughs> just witty, witty. Um, but I think with a football program, you can build a lot of tradition, uh, a lot of branding, mm -hmm. uh, but I've managed football. Um, it was the one sport at Clark Atlanta that we just could not get up and running because it costs so much and so many um, human and fiscal resources go into it. And a lot of community um, support and engagement, a lot of bringing alumni back to build the infrastructure. So it's a mess. I didn't stay long enough to do it. If I would have stayed, I'm sure we would have gotten it done. We had one successful year, and um, during my time, we were six and five. That's as close as we got to a winning right. season. But above 500. Above 500, yeah. but that was the first in like 10 years. It's tough. It's tough. But our mm -hmm. women's basketball team is 12 and 0 right now. Is that right? <laughs> right. 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 Team 12 and 0 right now. I'm going to give it to you. That was slick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> real quick. okay. okay. <laughs> no. Yeah, women's basketball game. Black basketball has been killing the game. That's awesome. But now that you have been here for um, one quarter now, right, yes. since last fall, yes. what is something that you plan to kind of bring to UCR as students can become more involved within UCR athletics? Well, one of the things is I think that our student athletes have, have to become a part of the fabric of the university. So we don't want to be just a silo, a, a separate entity of the campus. Um, athletic facilities are on one wing of the campus, and we don't get involved in what's going on on the main campus at the Bill Tower, um, at the Hub. <laughs> I hang out a lot at that space because I like to see the student interactions. Um, so I think that we have a responsibility to get engaged with different things like, you know, late night. Um, different things that the service organizations on campus are doing. Uh, we want to be invited and involved. I think we'll get friends of the program that way and then the students will support us more um, as a result. So I, one thing if I could solicit um, the students do, is, that is invite us to be a part of what they're doing. So if you have things going on that you need 300 student athletes to you know, <laughs> attend, I have them. <laughs> so, um, or even they could even attend some of the events, right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. They would love to. Their times are very, you know, restricted. But um, what I've seen in my time here is that they don't know about a lot of things that are going on outside of their class schedule, outside of their competition That's schedule, um, outside of the community engagement we involve them in. So um, some organizations, when I tell them that, they send me the information. And then I'll become responsible for it. And I'm, I'm game for that. Okay. Now, it seems like a lot of the problem is that the students just really don't know um, too much about how to be engaged and more than just having a schedule of all the games. But what's one thing that we as students can come and actually give more of that support you're talking about to the student athletes? Well, um, you know, we have to inform you as much as we can. If we can get into the residential halls, if we can get into the dining um, services to uh, promote the games more, if we can have more kind of pep rally type things like we had during homecoming, celebrations, tailgating, um, all of those are college experiences that I've had everywhere I've been. Um, not so much since I've been at UCR, but um, I definitely got the support of the administration, Chancellor Kim, who hired me that um, those are some of the things that we want to be able to do to engage the students, the campus, the community. So um, when we have things like that, we need you all to you know, show up. We had a yeah. tailgate last two weeks ago or last week that we, we promoted with the fraternities and sororities, and um, we didn't have such a show. Okay. Well, y'all have food there, right? We did. What kind of food? <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm just, I just want to know. Now, chicken, we had chicken. Okay. <laughs> where's the next one? Um, the next one, we, we won't have another one before the year's out. Uh, we're getting prepared for the Big West Conference. So that's uh, March 9th through the 12th. So okay. um, we, we'll, we'll start planning some things for um, next year, and hopefully we'll get you all more information that you can in, in, attend and enjoy. That sounds good. Show on my calendars for March 9th. 
But that is all the time that we have right now. Thank you so much, Tamika Jones, for Thank joining you. us Thank today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have our second guest on the show. Please give it up for lecturer Wallace Cleave. <laughs> so you are here to tell us a little bit about UCR's current rankings, correct? Sure. All right, all right. Um, well, first, could you uh, just introduce us, to introduce yourself to us? Um, I know you're a professor. Or a lecturer. lecturer. Yes, the university exactly. writing program. So I'm sorry if you've ever taken one of the composition classes. That's 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 me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Master mentor for the program too. So I train the TAs that uh, also teach those courses as well. Got it. Got it. So tell us, what should students know about UCR's current um, rankings, especially within the U.S. News and World Report? Well, first of all, that um, we're kind of in a bit of a war that people don't really even realize is exist, exists. Um, our ranking in 2010, uh, the U.S. News and World Report, we were at 94th, so we're in the top 100. Um, this year in 2015, we slipped down to 121st, and that doesn't make any sense because UCR has gotten better and better and better. Um, we know that for a lot of reasons. One reason is that students want to come here. Um, the UC enrollment numbers last year, nine, we had a 9.8% increase in uh, students who wanted to go to UCR, as opposed to UC's overall 5.8%. So people want to come here. They realize it's a great school. And there's something fishy going on there. As the chancellor said, and I'll kind of paraphrase him in a, a Washington Post interview, um, I'm not sure what they're valuing in the U.S. News and World Report, but whatever it is, it's inconsistent with public education. And so we're kind of in this little battle, and it's a lot worse because UCR was ranked, and we should be very proud of this, number two in the Washington Monthly mm -hmm. um, ranking. And what and, were those rankings based upon? Well, that's the really interesting question. Um, the, really what we should start with is what the U.S. News and World Report rankings are based on. And uh, as they like to say, they're based on, well, some of their rankings are good. 27.5% of their rankings are based on graduation rates. And that makes sense. That's a, that's a good number. But 22.5% are based on what they call surveys, which is you know sending out surveys to high school counselors saying, what schools do you think are the best? And that's... But how can they know? Yeah, that's a big problem. Because, of course, they're just going to replicate what they've already heard from U.S. News and World Report, right? So yeah. you see the problem. And some of the other things are alumni giving and what they call selectivity, how hard it is to get into. Or as other people have said, uh, fame, wealth, and exclusivity. Those don't seem like good things to base your uh, college rankings on. It definitely doesn't yeah. um, benefit public institutions. Exactly, exactly. And so other um, groups have come along and found some other ranking systems. Uh, my favorite right now is, as I said, Washington Monthly, which ranks us number two. <laughs> which, okay, that's probably why it's my favorite. They're right after San Diego, but we're doing great. Um, and it is based on social mobility. So in other words, what, what bang for your buck do you get? How well do our students do after they get out of here um, as compared to how they would if they hadn't gone to a university? Um, the other criteria is research. Now, that's obvious, right? That should be an absolutely critical element. And then the third one, and I really like this. I know it sounds a little touchy-feely, but um, it's basically social service. How much do they give back to the community? It can be everything from people going into the Peace Corps to charitable hours spent. So our students are good people. And I like that. <laughs> that makes me happy. So, and, and then, of course, there's the whole diversity issue, too. We're a very diverse university um, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of income levels, and well, probably not as diverse, but we definitely draw from a lower income, a lot of first generation students, which is wonderful. So diversity is something that's really become a mantra of UCR, right. and something we take a lot of pride in, something we should have pride in, but why exactly is that diversity important? Well. Okay, I'm, for me, diversity is critically important just from a personal standpoint. I'm part of the Gabrielino Tongva tribe, which is the uh, local indigenous people for the Los Angeles area. And Native Americans are terribly underrepresented at schools. Um, we tend to enroll at slightly less than, or slightly more than, no, less than half the average rate um, and graduate at about two-thirds the rate. 
And that really indicates, you know, how difficult school can be for um, people who come from minorities that don't have, especially first generation college students. Um, but UCR has a great track record with this mm -hmm. and uh, has really become a place where a lot of diverse students want to go. Um, I, I told you the statistics that we, we increased by 9.8% our enrollment, but what's also really telling is African American students were up by 12.5%, Pacific Islanders by 15%, uh, Latinos by 12%. So diverse students want to come here and that's fantastic. And um, I think that the real message is, you know, why should people want to come there? Because come here because it's very welcoming and very encouraging of that. But then the other question, the other part of that question is, well, what does diversity do for us? Yeah, how can that benefit a student's experience here? In in all sorts of ways. I mean, obviously, you know, if you come from a diverse background, you're going to be more comfortable if there are other students who, you know, aren't all looking exactly the same. Um, if your campus respects that, and we do a really good job with that here. Um, I'm active with the Native American Student Center and some of the other organizations on campus, and we do a really good job of, of, t of helping students feel like they have a community here. But if you want to get really practical, the reality is diversity is just good. It's just a good thing, and this is what's really nice. It's because we all know, we all say diversity is, oh yes, we've got to champion it, but we don't often say why. Well, this is an innovation economy. And diversity is the key to innovation. Study after study shows this. Um, and it's diversity across the board. It, uh, ethnic diversity is critically important if you want to have what we call a diversity of ideas, getting people who have different ideas from each other. They're not all thinking the same way, saying the same things. That makes everybody more innovative. Um, if you have diversity of gender, if you have a mix of men and women, you're more, your groups are going to be more creative. Um, that's uh, an MIT survey showed that really, really effectively. So um, essentially, you're making the world a better place. Yeah, well, and, and, <laughs> but I mean, okay, better place is great, but you know that doesn't pay the bills. But Google, <laughs> right? But you said that it leads to more innovation. It so does. that innovation will lead to a grower, a higher oh, yeah. economy, thus a higher GDP, which will have that domino effect on the. Oh man, you're making my argument for me. <laughs> 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 I've got, I've got the but you got it. No, you caught it totally. Google, right? <laughs> Who's, who's yeah. the, you know, was just recently the biggest company in the world for you, 10 seconds? You, you, take, you take Steve Jobs, for example, who came from homes, a, yeah. uh, a city in Syria. Yeah. And God knows that we've already ridden the next Steve Jobs for what's going on in Syria already. Right. And being how, seeing as how Apple is the most profitable country, profitable company in the world, which pays billions of dollars in taxes, I mean... Think about that for a second. If you rid diversity and you rid someone like Steve Jobs, which we possibly have done already, yeah. then you've already essentially erased, like, you've already erased the next Apple product, the next iPhone, the next like mm -hmm. music, it, you know, everything. You know, and those companies sense. know that. Yeah, Google, they, they know that. in their own internal survey, said that it was the most critically important thing for their innovative groups, for their groups that were doing new and exciting mm -hmm. technology, mm -hmm. um, was diversity. Now, there's a, there's a danger, there's a flip side to diversity, which is trust. A lot of people don't trust somebody who's different. I mean, it's an unfortunate truth. But, so sometimes you do risk having problems fail. But you've gotta take risks. And the rewards are so great because innovation overall sh is, is determined by the diversity of the groups that are working on it. And then you want cold hard numbers. This is my favorite one. There's a great study out of Columbia and the University of Michigan. Um, that surveyed over 1,500 Standard & Poor Index, you know, the big stock market, make all the money companies. And they found that adding a woman to um, a directorial position was worth a stock increase of $42 million. Million. For one position? One, adding one woman to the board. That strikes me, and then there was another uh, University of Texas study that showed a very similar survey with about 175 national banks um, with racial diversity. So diversity pays. It's economically a good idea. So I think that's about the strongest argument you can make. You got me. <laughs> I have no response after that. Um, but if right now we're consistently um, ranked within the top mid-100s by this U.S. News World yeah. Report, do you think that there's ever a chance that we'll actually excel? Or well, I mean, there has been talk that, you know, maybe we're being punished because we get these other numbers that are so great. Punished. The Washington, well, it, they're, they're kind of like a little bit of a mafia of, of college <laughs> rankings. I mean, they're the only game in county. You've got, you got to realize, they just kind of invented this wholesale in 1983 as a way to keep their business going. 
And it's not based on like anything logical or Malcolm Gladwell's come out and just thrashed them. Uh, Robert Reich, who was here this time last year, mm -hmm. uh, visited UCR and said, UCR is the model for what universities should be doing. Ignore uh, US News and World Report. Pay attention to Washington Monthly. We're doing it right. And he's now, you know, Bernie Sanders economic guru. Um, so, I mean, this- he said that about yeah. us. Oh yeah, yeah, you can see it on Facebook. It went viral. It was this great, wonderful post. He's the nicest guy. Um, yes, he is very nice. He's really <laughs> But he's also a brilliant economist. He was the uh, Secretary of Labor under Clinton the last mm -hmm. time the economy didn't suck. So oh, right. probably should listen to him. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. He's really a great guy. Um, and he loves UCR, so yeah. Well, I love UCR too. He's my favorite economist. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much for what you've come and you provided to us. All right, so please give it up for our last and final guest, Daniel Lopez. Woo! So how you doing, Daniel? Oh, I'm doing great. How about you? All right, so let me ask you. You've heard probably too many times about the damn, Daniel. <laughs> you already know. You're, Back uh, in oh, the game, you see a late night. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. So tell us, um, what's your major? Um, anything else that you're involved in on campus? All right, so uh, I'm a fourth year linguistics and anthropology double major. Uh, and I guess now uh, I've, I'm just involved with, with the pantry. I'm also involved with a few uh, campus organizations uh, under Chicano student programs. Uh, but most of my time is you know, taken up by work for, for the pantry. So that's our pantry, right? Yeah, our pantry. Mm -hmm. So could you explain to us what that is and how you became involved with our pantry? Right, so uh, our pantry, it's a... Uh, it's a space for uh, students in need to access if, if, if they are in need of food. Uh, so the difficulty uh, with trying to describe food, uh, if you need food, is, is that we're, we've used this language called food insecurity. Uh, and the problem with that is a lot of students don't know whether or not they're food insecure. Um, so a lot of the times it goes, uh, it goes to say, you know, um, like, are you eating the right types of food? Like, even, even if you, I don't know, maybe you're, you're eating five nights a week uh, ramen, but that's not, you know, the necess necessarily the most nutritious types of food. So all of that can account for, for, for food insecurity. And uh, this space is designed for those students who, who either are tied on a budget or uh, don't have, you know, the time to go down to the grocery store uh, or, you know, simply they're, they're, eating, they're eating a lot of food. It's just they're not getting the right types of food. Of uh, food and nutrition, so th this space is designed for, no, for those a, students. Yeah, yeah, that's a great resource that I think even more students should know about. Right. Um, was there anything that prompted its um, pretty much why it was founded? Was there anything that kind of led to the discovery? Of the yeah. So uh, the primary discussions actually started uh, in an organization that I'm involved in called Poder. Uh, it's the undocumented and uh, ally student group on on campus. Uh, at that time, the the president, Ana Coria, who is now the, uh, the director for undocumented student programs, uh, thought up of the idea uh, of having a pantry for undocumented students. Uh, and actually, uh, the uh, newspaper of this week has, a, has a, a small article in the opinion section for, for the pantry. So go ahead and, and read that for more information. <laughs> but uh, so the idea was to set up a, a small pantry for undocumented students. But, uh, uh, at that time, she was uh, about a quarter away from from graduating, and she uh, didn't have enough time to really, you know, continue the project. And that summer, she asked me if I could take it over. That was my uh, transition from second to third year, and I I was like, okay, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do it. I'll take it. Um, and uh, since then, it's uh, it's kind of been been my my project, my my baby that I that I've been taking care of uh, and and trying to to develop into a larger larger project uh, project and. Since then, um, you know, we've, we've had the opportunity and, and the privilege to, to work alongside many, uh, many groups on campus, including uh, uh, the, the R Garden, where right now we're, we're we pretty much uh, merged under, under the well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with Rafid, you know, we, we, uh, we have this, this pledge of $1,000 from, from Swipe Out Hunger, uh, and, you know, we, we couldn't be happier and, and, and uh, from, 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 you know, from that sense. Like, We're always yeah. happy to help out. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and you know, like, it's, it's a huge privilege to, to work with, with yeah. such a great 
great group of, of people who are really in, you know interested in, in their passion. They do similar work anyway, so we wanted to target students on campus. So to see you do something like this, it just makes us feel really happy and always glad to be a part of it. Yeah, thing, and you know, like I said, you know, we couldn't we couldn't be happier. <laughs> so having having that that partnership and ensuring that you know our students are getting mm -hmm. you know the, the quality food for for the quality education that this school uh, provides. So if students can come here to get um, food from the Apache, have you ever found that some of them may find it difficult or at all like uneasy or embarrassed to even come and ask for that? Like, has that been a rising problem? Yeah, it, so that that's kind of one of the uh, the main issues that we've been trying to tackle at, at the pantry and, and the well uh, is uh, is that stigma that that uh, people grow up in communities where it, you know it's it's frowned upon if, if you can't provide for yourself and uh, we want to let uh, let people know that you know pe people's situation do, do change overnight and uh, and it is okay for uh, for students to, to come by and, and, and ask for assistance uh, and you know that that's the uh, the great thing about you know working under uh, a, uh, uh, an honor system that, that we've, that we've uh, implemented at, at the pantry is that you know, we don't ask for people to provide proof of, of whether or not they, they are in need. You know, um, as a student, you know, you, you know when you're in need and, and you know when you, you can come by and, and use the, the services. Yeah. And real quick, um, where can we actually find our pantry? So uh, it's located in the hub. It's uh, the Bear's Den. Uh, we're uh, for this this uh, for the winter quarter. We're open uh, eight to twelve on Wednesdays. Uh, so come by tomorrow. If you've never checked that out, uh, or Thursdays from uh, from ten to twelve. Awesome. Yeah. We'll so it's sure. uh, across uh, across the C store, the the Scotty store next to the ATM machines. That's right. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for um, telling us about the art pantry. We'll <laughs> All right, so I'm here in what is a taxi. We're about to play a game called Taxi Cab Highlander Edition. Now the way this works is that we're actually gonna have passengers come in with the location, a UCR location. They have to come and describe that to me without saying the word itself. And after they describe it, the passenger will become the driver and the cycle continues. And before we get started, I just wanna appreciate our two volunteers. They are both students, Patty and Maurice. All right, let's get it started. <laughs> okay. Where are we going today? Okay, um, we're gonna go a little bit to the back of campus. Um, okay. It's a lot of plants. It's very green. Green. Yeah. Uh, Is it the Botanical Gardens? Yes. Okay, cool. Alright, where are we going? Uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's actually like, you know, by the bell tower. Okay. You know, one of those little buildings. Uh, okay. Okay. That's what professors love to give, you know, bad grades. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it rhymes with my homie Keith, Chief Keith. Speak <laughs> Huh? Speak? Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> So there's uh it's it's supposed to look like mountains. Um, it's brown, it's you know, all up in your face once you see it. Um, uh, it's actually, you know, not not too far from here. Um, something that a cripple said? Oh <laughs> uh, well, you never know, you never know. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, all right, it's it's a building, you know, they there's the, a lot of paint, you know, a lot of ceramics, uh, it's cross lot one. Okay. Um, oh, you still want to go to the art building? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the oh, place. Yeah. That's the place. Yeah. There we go. Hey, where can I take you today? 
Uh, I'm kind of hungry. Can we get something to eat? All right, so uh, we have a few places around campus. Uh, can you describe it for me? Mm, I'm kind of in the mood for maybe uh, some french fries, maybe some chicken, fries. some burgers. Okay. Uh, maybe we could take a break and play some maybe, pool. Maybe the barn? No, no. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think, uh, is it Latitude 55? Yeah. 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 We never have this. <laughs> what, what is it that we don't have? Uh, well, it's something that's been snubbed to us several times. <laughs> Sorry, say again? <laughs> watch, you, watch where you're going, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so it's a concert. Not block party, not spring splash, but... Uh -huh. Oh, he, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's the end of the game, everybody. <laughs> so that's the end of our show, everyone. We apologize. We did not have enough time for the football team. But special <laughs> thanks to Tamika Smith-Jones, lecturer Wallace Cleves, and Daniel Lopez. Catch us next time here at UCR Late Night. Woo!